Welcome back, everybody, to Before I Forget. Uh, this uh, YouTube channel has been started so I can lay down all my memories of my life in music, um, both as a fan, as somebody that worked in the business, uh, get them down on video so I don't forget about them. Uh, a lot of these stories are taken from my book, which has been finished for a while now. Um, trying to get that published also. I have a finished uh, screenplay for a while uh, about my life as a DJ uh, in the nightclubs in the early 1980s. Um, combination Goodfellas meets Saturday Night Fever kind of thing. Um, so I've got a lot of content and uh, I'm going to be telling stories on this channel. Um, basically, get them down on tape. Um, so a lot of people ask me about Motley Crue, how I was able to hang out with Motley Crue and how that all started. But I mean, it really, everything goes back to me being a DJ. I DJed a school dance in ninth grade. Um, very basic one turntable, little home amplifier and home speakers. And I DJed that school dance in ninth grade. And it all started from there. Um, on up to the late 70s, uh, I was working as a disco DJ. I was a kid, 17 years old, working in discos, playing disco music. I was a massive rock fan. Uh, I mean, I've been to a zillion concerts and had, um, uh, you know, really was a, a massive fan of Kiss and um, a lot of bands of that era, Aerosmith and lots of rock stuff, lots of bands. I was a huge rock fan. Um, but I also was a DJ, and at that time, you played as a DJ. If you weren't on the radio, you worked in discos and nightclubs, and that's where you played music. And that was always my first love, was playing music with people in a nightclub. Uh, it's just something that stuck with me early on. Um, you know, when I was young, my dad had some interest in some nightclubs in Long Island, and he brought me around when I was a kid, and I hung out in the DJ booth, and it really took off from there. So... Flash forward a little bit, um, I'm working at a nightclub um, on Long Island called Malibu, which at the time was a big club. I mean, it probably held, you know, close to 3,000 people. Um, and you had all the bands of the day play there, the new wave post-punk genre, uh, you know, B-52s, Ramones, um, Psychedelic Furs, Adam Ant, uh, Susie and the Banshees, U2 played there. Um, so I was a DJ there in 1981. And when you're a DJ, you start making contacts in the music business, record companies, such and such. And um, people would, record company reps would come down to the club and bring me records and ask me to play them. And I mean, this was a very big club. I mean, and it was, you know, early 1981. So the drinking age was still 18 and there was not a photograph on a driver's license yet. So it was a very easy to go out as a young person. I mean, if you were 16, 17, you had a fake ID with no picture on it and you were in a club. So Malibu was a big club. It held almost 3,000. It was packed all the time. Um, major bands played there. Um, and I was a DJ. So I met a gentleman from Electro Records who came down and asked me to play a record one time. The record was called Johnny Are You Queer by Josie Cotton, which was like a minor new wavy, clubby hit. It was on the radio a little bit too. But anyway, he asked me to play that record and I did. I played it right there and then for him. I listened to it in the headphones, checked it out. I said, let me throw this on for him. And I played it and he and I became fast friends. So uh, I was aware of Motley Crue from the Leather Records days um, and was a fan. Um, and, um, you know, when they signed to Elektra, I had met them briefly one time at Electro Records. I had been up there picking up some records to play at the club or whatever it might be, and I had met Motley Crue when they signed their deal. So this had to be, I don't know, whenever. It was maybe by that point, it was fast forward to 82 or something like that. Anyway, um, that's how I first met Motley Crue is through my friend at Electro Records. So when Shout the Devil came out, I was just like blown away like everybody else. I was looked at this cover. I was like, wow, look at this. this is, these guys are insane. So uh, we were all big fans of Motley Crue, myself and my friend Bruno Ravel. Um, and, um, you know, his, well, it was my friend too, but Steve West. And we were all into Motley. Um, so uh, when Shout the Devil came out, they went on tour with Ozzy. 
And my friend at Electra Records got me tickets and backstage passes, and that's how it all started. Um, and, um, you know, we like to party, you know, like Motley. So we were, you know, indulging. Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a very cool connection with those guys. It was mainly Nikki and Tommy. I mean, Vince was Vince. He didn't care about you if you, did, if you weren't a girl, really. And um, Mick was older, Mick Mars, and he was just kind of like, he was in the mix, but like minor. You know, he wasn't, it was all Nikki and Tommy. We hung with them. Uh, and uh, the first time we saw them live was when they opened for Ozzy at the Brendan Byrne Arena in New Jersey, opening for Ozzy. And that's the first time we were backstage with them. And, uh, you know, and then from there, it just, we went to four, I think four or five shows in a row in New Jersey, uh, Nassau Coliseum in Long Island, um, New Haven, Connecticut, which was always, anytime we saw Motley in New Haven, it was a crazy time. Um, Madison Square Garden in Manhattan. So we, you know, that's how I got hooked up with Motley Crue. And that's how I got hooked up with a lot of bands. It really, everything started for me being a DJ. Um, and it's hard to really put into context what a DJ was back then as a parent. You know, today, it's a whole different thing. You know, EDM and guys just play their computer and wave and scream and blow off explosions and stuff. That's what an EDM show is. But there's really no, there's really no technical skill. If you've ever been in a nightclub, and it doesn't have to be a disco nightclub, you know, I mean, it could be techno or house music or, you know, uh, advanced European dance music. And to watch a DJ work a crowd is very, very exciting, but it's, it doesn't happen very much anymore, mostly due to technology. But um, everything started for me from being a DJ. I mean, I was working at Malibu at the time, big club, you know, I had access to a, my guest list and drink tickets and you know, it was very powerful position and everything I did started with me being a DJ. Everything, one thing led to another, to another, to another, to another, and it kind of all fell in my lap. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that's very true to my heart is being a DJ. Um, uh, you know, you had to really be on top of your music. You had to be, you either had to get free promos or you had to get you had to be at the store to get some hot import release or whatever it was. Today, you can download everything instantly and have it and play it, you know, uh, digitally. Back in those days, you had to go to the record store and wait in line, you know, hold me a copy. If you didn't have your copy for the weekend, you didn't have the song to play and you weren't on top of things. So being a DJ then was very cutting edge. It was very, you know, it was a powerful thing. Um, you know, at the time, I mean, you know, 1981, I was 80 years old. So, uh, 80 years old. I wish I was 20 years old in 1981. Um, but, uh, you know, that's how it all started. And, and um, I met a lot of people in record companies. Um, uh, and it all started for me being a DJ. Uh, and at the time, there were rockers and there were disco people. And they didn't mix. And, you know, there was, you know, disco sucks and all that stuff. But disco was a short-lived thing, really. Disco was like really in the national conscious. It was national consciousness. It was uh, 77 to like 79, really, were the disco years. And then came post-punk and new wave and new waves version of dance music and disco, which was a little bit cooler. It was a little bit more, you know... Uh, you know, European based and based out of London and it, it exploded from there. The British have always been very adept at taking American culture and turning it around and sending it back to America and making it something else, which they did with, uh, they took American house music and turned it into the whole rave culture, um, you know, Manchester and uh, Happy Mondays and the Hacienda Club and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, that's how it started for me, was being a DJ. Um, that's how I met Motley Crue. That's how I met Rat. That's how I met a lot of people in the business. Uh, I also worked for a record distributor at the time. 79, I started working for important record distributors, which eventually became Relativity Records. But important record distributors imported European records and sold them to stores in America. 
import stuff you couldn't get here. Um, you know, uh, and so I got a lot of music from working at that import distributor. I also got turned on to the new wave of British heavy metal in 79 and Def Leppard and Saxon and uh, uh, Maiden and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's how I started getting into that scene with Iron Maiden and uh, meeting them. And um, it was really, I mean, I was very driven to be in this somehow. And my entree to the business was being a DJ in a nightclub, um, when it meant something. Uh, when the drinking age was 18 and there'd be, you know, you go out to a club on a Tuesday night and there'd be 3,000 people there. I mean, it doesn't happen anymore. It's a different world. Um, so um, that's really it for this segment. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring you guys up to date on how I even got into this. And as we go further on with more videos, I will um, tell some more stories of how I got to um, work for LA Guns and how I met um, uh, some other people down the road, uh, the GNR guys, and and um, also we'll get into some more Motley stories. There's a lot of Motley Crue stories, like crazy ones, um, and everybody wants to hear about that, which I understand with the dirt and the new tour coming up and all that stuff. So there'll be a lot more Motley and uh, LA Guns tour stories. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to present it best and not bore you guys to death. Um, thanks for tuning in again, before I forget on my Instagram, but my main Instagram is 1985 road dog. There you'll see all the images that um, spurred on this um, video channel. Uh, people asking questions about it and about these different photographs and I would have to come back and type of little answers to people, but I figured let me tell some more stories while I'm still working on getting this book out and, um, uh, you know, working on my script, uh, getting that sold. And also, uh, I've been writing uh, treatments for a TV series based on the um, late 80s heavy metal rock scene. Um, uh, but anyway, thanks for listening to me, Babel. Um, hope to see you soon. Leave me some messages on my uh, Instagram if you want me to uh, tell some specific stories. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Appreciate it. Ciao.